Well, I bring you greetings again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm coming to you from the sanctuary of War Harvest Church North, located in beautiful Blairsville, Georgia. If you live anywhere in the vicinity, I want to invite you to come out and be a part of our service Sunday morning at 10.30, uh, Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. If, if you live too far away, you can always join us live streaming on Sunday mornings at 10.30 Eastern. Uh, we began airing our uh, services live at that time. Uh, today, the Lord has given us a powerful word. We want to share the first part of that segment. It is entitled, Look Up. There was a day when uh, Job had a messenger come and said, uh, your cattle were out in the field, uh, your oxen were plowing, and there was a storm that came up and, and his, his herds were destroyed. And then after that, someone told him about the, the children being destroyed, his home destroyed. It was one messenger after another bringing an evil report. We're living in times just like that where you're hearing one evil report after another. Jesus gave us encouragement. He said, when you start seeing these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your eyes for your redemption draws nigh. So be sure and hang on and listen to every word the Lord has given me to share with you today to build encouragement and strength and, and hope inside of your heart so that you can overcome this world. And I'll come back at the end and share some more things with you. There was something that went off in my spirit. And I knew God was not done with this scripture. His, his word is alive. And when he wants to speak something to us out of the word, he lets his Holy Spirit breathe life over that word that has been written. And it becomes rhema to us. And so I want to share what the Holy Spirit has given uh, today for you. Not only you here, but those that will be watching via television or CD or whatever, a DVD. Uh, look there in Job 1.13. Today's message is entitled, Look Up. It says in uh, verse 13, Now there was a day when Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. He was, uh, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell, down, uh, fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. I, I find this very interesting that this seemed to transpire shortly after God's and Satan's conversation. Now up to this point, just look at all that Job lost that he had. God had blessed him tremendously, had he not? Now, it gives the number of how many animals he lost uh, in chapter 42, but you can read that later. The man had great wealth. He had great possessions, and he had greater faith. And so after, coincidentally, God and Satan has this conversation about Job's integrity, Job's faith, Job's sincerity of his faith, it seems that things just seemed to happen to him. It seemed almost coincidental, but it's, it, it's too coincidental to be a coincidence, if that makes sense. That one thing after another happened to him. You talk about having a bad day. He had a day straight from Hades, right? Now, when I got to thinking about this, what came to my mind is all the stuff that's going on in the world right now. And, and 
can you imagine he gets a, a text out to the intercessors at the church and he says, pray for my animals. Then you get another text, pray for my houses, pray for my this and pray for that. And you're like, my God, what's going on at Job's house? And, and it's, it's like, how do, you, how do you handle so much tragedy all at once? How do you respond to it? How do you, how do you take on this kind of weight, this kind of pressure all at once and stand up under it? Right? Turn with me to Luke 21. Luke 21, verse 7. The disciples came to Jesus uh, and asked him when things were going to transpire that he had prophesied. And uh, look here in verse 7. It says, So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said to them, Take heed that, uh, that you, you're not deceived. For many will come in my name, meaning I am anointed, saying, I am he, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first. But the end will not come immediately. See, we're seeing these things come to pass right now. But the end will not come immediately. Then he said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilence. And there will be fearful signs and great signs, uh, fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. Talking about the church delivering you up to the synagogues and the prisons, you will be brought before kings and rulers uh, for my sake. Now, drop down to verse 16. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put uh, some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your pos uh, patience, possess your soul. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain, and let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now, Whenever we see these things escalating like we are to, in today's world, there's something going on. Now, we got those reports about Job, one right after the other, like contractions, one on top of the other, right before the birthing pains, right, I mean, right before the delivery of the child. The birth pains get harder, and they get more intense, and they get closer uh, together, where they're just one up on top of the other, and the, and the mother is overwhelmed because she's not getting any rest. Now, Spring could help me preach this this morning, but she's not here because she's giving labor, I mean, delivery. So... We're seeing an escalation of spiritual warfare as well as conflicts in the natural. It's overwhelming, to say the least, to try and comprehend all that is going wrong in this country and around the world recently. Now, as, as Satan got permission from God to touch all that Job had but not touch his life, we see these things breaking out. Something touches it and sets off a, a, a cataclysmic uh, problem in Job's life that brings devastation and destruction into his life. Before that, there was peace. Are you with me? And then all of a sudden, something breaks loose that causes trouble. Now, America tries to be a God-fearing, or used to be God-fearing, peace-loving kind of people. But sometimes these demonic spirits want to go and, and touch hot spots where things are brewing under the surface. And if you ever want to see what's really in people's hearts, let something touch off something in their heart. 
and you'll see just how vile people can be. Can I get a witness? Now, we're seeing all, this, all of a sudden, just in the last month, an escalation of violence and death and, and persecution and all kinds of stuff, not only in our nation, but around the world, are we not? We're seeing riots and looting and violence out in Missouri over the death of a, a young black man. Thousands of illegal in immigrants pouring through our southern border, which is creating a logistical nightmare for those states who are having to take on this huge responsibility. Israel being bombarded by rockets from Hamas, being persecuted by other nations because of their willingness to defend their own people. Putin is, is from uh, Russia, the president of Russia, trying to invade Ukraine. ISIS, or ISIL, is slaughtering tens of thousands of Christians along with other peoples of faith that do not agree with their radical Islamic faith. Our own government seems to be working overtime trying to silence the church and remove God from the eyes of our military men and women while promoting other faiths. There are just a few, these are just a few things that I happen to hear about just this week. You talk about a week from hell. This has been a week. And, and you got to understand or ask, what is going on in the world and in America? God has already told us in the Word. He's given us, given us examples out of the Bible how Satan will go about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But the Bible says, resist him. He's already a defeated foe when you're in Christ Jesus. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Don't be moved by him or his little uh, attempts to try to move you away from Christ. Now, I don't know how all of this has affected you, but for me being a prayer warrior and those that are called to this church who are in intercession, it's definitely overwhelming. Now, when I say it's overwhelming, let me uh, break it down what I'm saying. You can pray somebody gets hurt, and they, they text us, they email us or call us and say, this person is hurt, please pray for them. And then all of a sudden you get another one, this person has died. This conflict has brought out, been broken out. And, and then you get one right after the other, right after the other, and it's like, God, give me cow gone or rapture, one of us, take us away. It's getting too much. And so I said, Lord, I, I need something to help the, the people of your uh, kingdom understand what is going on and how we're to respond to all the tragedy, all the murders, all the slaughtering, all of the upset, all of the persecution that's coming against us. It can be overwhelming, can it not? And if you're not careful, you'll get out of faith and into fear. That's what you do not want to happen. Now... You start seeing all these things, these events taking place, and you feel the pressure at your own home and in your own pocketbook, and you start thinking, what am I compared to all that is transpiring in the world? How can I make a, even a small difference in the world? Can I tell you, this is a tactic of Satan to try and get Christians in this nation and around the world in fear and overwhelmed in the hopes that we will give up on God. So if that describes you right now, I want you to take a deep breath and let it out. Look at Mark 6, 34. The Holy Spirit quickened this scripture to me and said, I want you to address this issue, began addressing this issue by using this, this story out of the Bible. Mark 6, 34. I'm not an ostrich. I don't believe in sticking my head in the sand when trouble happens. I believe you, you address it head on, right? Mark 6, 34. Are you there? And, when, and Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away. Sounds like a real compassionate church, don't it? 
Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, Here comes some wisdom from God for us. They've got a, a, a overwhelming dilemma on their hands. They're in the middle of nowhere, and they've got thousands of people that are starving. They're hungry. And so their answer is, send them away and let them go to another country and, and eat there. Here's what Jesus says. You give them something to eat. I want you to let that soak in. You own a fixed income? All of us are on a fixed income. And God says, feed all these thousands of people. Now, when God tells you to do something that is beyond your comprehension, your ability, don't say, God, I can't. God already knows that. Say, all right, God, obviously you have a plan you have not tuned me into. So go ahead and speak. I'm listening. Right? The disciples' answer to being overwhelmed by the great need of the multitude was to do nothing. Now, there's your fine church. We're the do-nothing church. Come here and do nothing. When we see a need, do nothing about it. It don't cost you anything come to this church because we do nothing. That was their answer. Do nothing. Send them away. What kind of witness of Christ is that to those that were following him? But what was Jesus' response to the horrendous task set before him? Did he get into fear and begin to wring his hands in worry? He found out what was available, and then he took it. I'm getting ahead of myself. He said, uh, and they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 uh, denarii of worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties, and when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up. There's the title of this message. He looked up to heaven. Why did he look to heaven? That's where his power's coming from. That's where his directions are coming from. That's where his wisdom is coming from. So he looked up to heaven. The first thing he did was took what they had, and then he looked up. He blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And the two fishes he divided among them all. So they all ate and were what? Wow. Five loaves and two fishes fed 5,000 men plus women and children, and they were all filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fra fragments and of the fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Now... Jesus took what they had and he looked up to heaven and he asked the Father for the blessing and then after that he gave thanks and handed it out. He broke the bread and the fish and he handed it out to them. Now, he found out what was available. What do you have in the house? Do you remember when uh, Elijah was sent to the widow of Zarephath and he asked the widow, he says, what do you have to eat? She says, I have a little corn, a little, I mean, oil, a little meal. I'm going to go fix me and my son a, a little cake. We're going to eat it, and then we're going to die. So as she's going with her sticks to prepare a fire to burn, to get ready for the, the making of the bread, he says, fix me a cake first. And she looks at him like, you just like all those other televangelists. You want me to do what? Fix you a cake first? I don't have enough for us. But she did it. Why? God had already told Elijah, listen to this. He says, go to Zarephath because I have already commanded a widow to cook for you. 
So when he went and told her that, he was under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now, it was up to her whether she would obey God's voice, not Elijah's voice, but God's voice or not. If she obeyed him, God was going to bless her. But if he didn't, if she didn't, then God couldn't bless her. Are you with me? So God, God wasn't wanting to take from her, was he? No. What was he trying to do? He was trying to get her to give him something to if you don't give God anything, he has nothing to work with in which to give it back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So Jesus found out what they had available, and they gave it to him, and he took it. Then he looked up to heaven, and he prayed the blessing over it. Now, the times and the problems like we find ourselves facing today won't be solved by a do-nothing church or government. We must resist the temptation to get into fear. We have to look up to the Father and offer up to Him what we can do and let Him bless our little until the entire need is met. That, ha that is how the church in America has made it from its conception until now. We took what God had given us, what, what little bit we had, and said, God, our little bit is not enough. We give it to you. We honor you in it. We give it to you. And when we did that, God blessed it, and he caused it to go out to the nations of the world. World. And because of that, God blessed us and raised us up. So we as Christians, we as Americans need to stop getting into fear. Fear stops forward progress. Say that with me. Fear stops forward progress. When we became a progressive nation, we stopped progressing. Now, Look back at Luke uh, 21 6. Y'all okay? That's just the introduction. Luke 21 28. I just read it to you. Or I thought I did. I may not have. Luke 21 28. Jesus has given us. Uh, a laundry list of things of what's going to happen in the days preceding his return. He tells us how horrible it's going to be all over. But he gets down to verse 28. And thank God he put this in here. Now when, you, now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Isn't that powerful? When, when we start seeing these things begin to happen, we're to look up and lift up our eyes because our redemption is drawing nigh. If we don't do that, people, we will start looking down in fear at the problems that we're faced with. But if we will look up and lift up our eyes and look under the hills whence cometh our help, our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, who neither slumbers nor sleep. He will watch over us and he will keep us and he he will guide us through even the hardest times. But we've got to trust in Him. If you don't, there's only one other option. Get in fear and backslide. God said to emphasize this scripture about looking up, lifting up your eyes because your redemption is drawing nigh when you see all these things begin to happen. We're to fix our eyes on the Lord. Hebrews 12 tells us this. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the suffering, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of majesty. When Peter was walking on the water, which was symbolic of us walking by faith, he began to sink when he took his eyes off Jesus. We're to look up and lift up our eyes and look to the hills. Jesus has a plan. Turn with me to Colossians, please. Colossians 3, beginning with verse 1. Are you born again? Amen. Well, then chapter 3 is for you. If you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are at Walmart. If you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, 
where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. What is he telling us today? Look up. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. Don't set your mind. Don't sit around and set your mind on the things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, uh, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. When the chaos of this world gets to be too much for you to handle, take that as an indication that you're getting too focused on the problem and not enough on the Lord's will to get you through this chaos. God wants you to get through this. He wants to bring us through it. It came to pass. Didn't come to stay. No trial lasts forever. There's a shelf life on every problem. Now, as Christians, we, we must, we must remember that we're here in this world on assignment. You're ambassadors of Christ. You've been given the ministry of reconciliation while you're here. Paul wrote Timothy, he says, No good soldier gets entangled with the things of this world. We're in this world, but we're not of it. Don't get caught up in the hysteria and drama to the point of getting into fear. If we allow fear to fill our hearts, then we have crossed that line. What line? The line that separates faith from unbelief. Now turn with me to Psalm 23. We're going to transition this. Psalm 23, 1. Are you there? The Lord is my shepherd. We're his sheep, right? He's our shepherd. Sheep are defenseless. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me. Who's leading here? The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. I hate to cut it short. This is such a powerful word that God has given me to share with his people. And, and he wants us to be encouraged. And so uh, you, you allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God to get in your heart. If you would like a, a copy of this in, in its entirety, we have DVDs available. You can uh, contact us there at the bottom of the screen. You'll have information. You can contact us and how to get a, a DVD or a CD of this message. And also, if you would like to stand with us uh, financially, sow a gift into this ministry, it would be greatly appreciated. The proceeds go strictly for the ministry to get the Word of God out to not only this nation, but the nations of the world. So thank you for tuning in. May God richly bless you until this time next week. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175. To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512. 